Hi folks, Brian Strausser, Principal and Chief Executive here at Bright Path. And we're back with our newly relaunched Bright Path Live Thursday show, 12 o'clock central every Thursday, where we'll be talking about the world of resiliency, crisis management, and business continuity. Today I want to talk about an article that we posted this morning about what the COVID-19 pandemic will mean for the office of the future. So, certainly something that many of you as business leaders have been dealing with already as you've thought about how to return to the office, return to work in some cases. Um, certainly many of us have been working from home uh, or working remotely, uh, but now we're starting to get into larger and larger phases of reopening where we're starting to think about what does that start to look like as we return to the office. I know some of our clients are looking at returning at timeframes between September and January. And of course, this will be really driven by what changes with the COVID-19 situation between now and those actual timeframes. And we also see that different states uh, and even municipalities or counties are putting different restrictions or guidelines in place uh, in terms of what companies will need to do before they can indeed return to the office. Um, what I want to talk about a little bit is <clears throat> kind of what changes we can expect as we start to do this and what are some things that you can do as business leaders to really envision that return to the office? What are some things that you need to think about as we move um, into this phase of what's going on uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic? There's a great article today in uh, Work Design Magazine that talks a little bit about some considerations uh, in terms of um, objectives for preparing to return to the office. And they're really um, kind of three simple things, three kind of guiding principles or objectives to have in mind. The first is to really think about optimizing the office experience. Uh, and here we're thinking about if you have to social distance and you may have to wear PPE like a cloth mask or even an N95 mask, what does that office experience start to look like and how can you best optimize that given the changes that will be necessary in the workplace. The second is to build a return to office strategy and that this strategy should include understanding what roles really need to be in the office, what comes in first when you're returning to the workplace, and then what comes in after that, thinking about kind of a multi-phased or layered approach uh, as an objective. Um, the third is to rethink, for the long term, rethink your company's attitudes and approaches to remote working. I know with the COVID-19 pandemic, in a lot of cases, we've been forced to remote work uh, for um, a number of positions that we might not have wanted to do prior to the pandemic making it a necessity. For example, one of our clients has a number of BPO workers, business process outsourcing workers uh, throughout Asia and, and other countries. And from a security standpoint, they were always required to work in the workplace because you could ensure the physical and information security of the work that they were doing. But with the pandemic, that's impossible. Um, they weren't able to have thousands of folks come into the office every day. So they were able to very rapidly transition into a remote work environment. So the long-term strategic question that they now have to work through is, well, is that the new normal? Is that the next normal that we're going to accept moving forward? Or will we want to have those thousands of folks back into the workplace uh, in 2021 when hopefully the pandemic as we know it today is behind us. So those are definite questions to consider um, as you, definite objectives rather that you should think about um, as you start to craft your return to work strategy. I wanna walk through the 10 points that we have in the article about how to design your post COVID-19 workplace. What does this start to look like as you consider uh, returning to the office in the near future? Um, as the reopening phases of the pandemic continue. Um, so one is to structure your workers' return into layered groups. And, here, and you've probably already done this to some extent, but what we wanna think about here is what are the workers who absolutely have to be in the workplace to perform their role? And that role should obviously be something that is critical to your organization's overall continuity of operations or you won't want to have them in at all. But what, what is that group of workers that have to be in the workplace first? And then start to think about well, what are the workers who have to be there to support them? That could be security, uh, facilities management, uh, it could be your cafeteria or food service that you might provide to your workers. It's probably your sanitation, your cleaning team, 
uh, whether that's insourced or outsourced or part of your facilities organization. But you're thinking about what is that first layer of folks that have to be in the workplace? What are the other workers that have to be there in order to support them? And just kind of think about building those circles out uh, for your workforce. And that becomes your layered groups, your layered approach strategy. Start with who has to be there, who has to support them, and then start to layer out what that begins to look like. And certainly, as I would encourage you to ponder this in terms of a slow build to capacity over a very long time horizon, eventually getting to 25% of your workforce, 50% of your workforce, 75% of your workforce, and, and continue to do that. The next one is to make sure that you've decided upon, uh, you've prepared and you've published your protective measures, your social distancing guidelines and protocols that you're going to have in place there in the workforce. Will you need to have six feet of separation in your workplace? Uh, in which case you may have to start thinking about dividing hallways into one-way areas. Um, you may have to look at open office space or cubicle configurations and start to look at um, spreading those out so that you have that six-foot diameter space when someone is working at their workstation. Um, you might have to look at private offices that today might be shared and have to take those to single occupancy offices. You'll have to think about your conference rooms and your meeting space and even your cafeteria space and how do you segment that off so that you're achieving the social distancing requirements that not just the requirements that your local government or your state government might require but what are the restrictions what are the requirements that you want to put into place as the continuity leader um, as the executives for your organization and that might be above and beyond what your government entities, what your regulators, your public health department may require. The next step to consider is to really look at how do you um, essentially reverse densification? How do you de-densify your workspace so that you can achieve those social distancing guidelines, so that you can achieve the occupancy guidelines that might be put into place, um, that you might put into place, but also what might your local government require or regulatory agencies require? The next checklist item is to survey your locations and determine you know, kind of what your office space preparedness is. What of these changes that we've talked about here briefly, what do those look like in your workspace and how can you then prepare to reconfigure that space where necessary in order to reach those protective measures that you're putting into place. The next is to consider what building technologies might help you. Um, as you think about the user experience and the wellness of your team in this workspace, that might include um, more frequent or stronger HVAC utilization. You might have different filters. Um, you may run <coughs> uh, fans and things more frequently. You might also want to look at, you know, what kind of touchless surfaces can you use uh, throughout the workspace in order to minimize the amount of cleaning you have to do, minimize the amount of spread that you may have to contain from a coronavirus, from a COVID-19 perspective. Um, smart lighting is another thing to consider, particularly if you're de-densifying your space. Can you do something with the energy utilization in the space that may help? Um, and also elevator challenges. If you think about the need to social distance, um, that's more difficult in elevators. So what guidelines will you put into place? How can you use technology that might be available for your elevator stacks? to assist with that. <clears throat> Are there other workarounds? Could you designate some elevators only for certain floors in order to <clears throat> have the most efficient flow of people uh, in and out of the building? Those are all challenges to consider as you think about going back into your space. The next one is to think about contact tracing strategies that you might want to pursue within your workspace. This comes into play, and I think we're still not sure how this might be driven by government requirements. But um, where we're seeing contact tracing a lot in, in companies and other organizations that have office space is really thinking about if I have an employee or a contractor who reports that they've tested positive for COVID or we have a suspected positive case, part of the challenge to think through is how can you appropriately notify individuals who might have come into contact with that person and you can even, and in some cases, you may want to require that they seek testing so that you can ensure that the workplace is safe. 
Certainly there's controversy around this approach from some different angles, but this is a requirement in some locations, and it may be something that you want to incorporate into your policies and your approach is someone reports that they've tested positive, what's your contact tracing requirements, and then what steps will you take in line with your HR and sick leave policies in line with that. Um, there's even, uh, you know, in some cases, you know, there's companies that are looking at um, technology-based screening prior to coming into the office. So, you know, they would have an app on a mobile device and they would, um, you would do your symptom check on here. You would say, no, I don't have a fever. I've not been exposed to anyone in the last 14 days. The kind of health questions, health screening questions. And by submitting that information, it enables their access badge to come into the office for the day. And if they go, no, I was, um, I was exposed to someone, well, then it denies them access and they'll have to work remotely. So that's something to consider. It's certainly the challenge here is that you have some privacy, there might be some privacy concerns. You might get into a little bit of a big brother uh, mentality there. But these health screening questions combined with temperature screening are a lot of what we're going to see before folks can come into the office. Uh, even vendors or uh, delivery drivers and things like that will have to go through this process. I know I took my kids to the dentist uh, a week ago Saturday, and um, as we were going into the dentist's office, we had to health screen in the hallway, the three of us. So two kids under 10 uh, filling out a health checklist. I mean, I, I filled it out, but they had to fill that, we had to fill that out for the three of us, separate checklists, and then we all had to be temperature screened, and then we were allowed into the waiting area to check in for our uh, for their appointments to have their teeth cleaned and their normal dentist checkup. So I think we're going to see a lot of that as you think about returning into the office, um, as you think about the kind of errands and appointments that you're required to do just through the course of, of what you do to, uh, to um, in the course of what you do at work and what you do to run errands and the things you do to support yourself and your family. So this is going to become more common over time. And so are there technological solutions to make some of this easier as opposed to having to have a security guard or a HR representative or a, or a safety officer, you know, at the entrance to your workplace, having to health screen every individual as they come in. The next two steps really revolve around trust and communication. We're really thinking about as you roll these things out, how do you in your return to work strategy, how do you do this in a way where you're being transparent with your team about what they can expect as they come into the office, that you're being transparent and open about what those steps are going to involve. If you're requiring health screening or temperature screening, there'll be privacy questions. So think about the kind of questions that your team might ask and make sure you're prepared for that or that you're communicating those steps in advance so that your team, your employees, understand what that's going to look like before the first time they even have to go through it. Um, again, being transparent and building trust with your employees as you work through this process is gonna be one of the most important things that you do. Um, and then lastly, I don't rush it. Um, if, you, if you're in an area that is still seeing a number of cases, you're still seeing an increase in cases and hospitalization, I would not rush your return to the office. Teleworking has uh, been shown to be very effective. A lot of our productivity challenges from February and March have really worked themselves out over time. And to, again, of course, this depends on what the business is that you're in and the steps uh, you know, involved in generating your product or service um, that might impact that. But if teleworking, if remote working is working, it's not a bad time to reevaluate your use of office space and what's really going to be the most efficient things that you can do to help your company move forward. Um, that office of the future uh, is certainly gonna look different than what our offices look like today. Uh, we've seen companies already start to reevaluate re their need for large headquarters buildings. Um, do you really have to have everyone in a space like that in order to be at the most productive for your organization in order to have the kind of collaboration necessary to move your company forward. And I think the way we think about office space um, in the future is gonna be very different than how we thought about office space prior to February of this year when the COVID-19 pandemic really crossed into the United States. 
Um, I think the future office is going to look like a hybrid version of what we've had in the past, combined with social distancing um, and other protective measures in the office, at least for the near future. And I think that this integration of folks in the office who have to be in the office in order to do their role, uh, partnering with remote workers through tools like Zoom and WebEx, uh, or even you know just FaceTime on a on an iPhone or a, or the similar uh, Google Hangouts on an Android device, that's going to be a lot of what our future workspace looks like moving forward. Don't be afraid to experiment and try some different things as you move your company through this as well. I'd love to hear your questions. Uh, we'll check back in the video uh, and see if you have anything uh, new that's posted here. Um, that's it for this edition of Bright Path Live. We'll be back next Thursday, 12 p.m. Central, with another live video Q&A uh, on a topic of interest. Thanks for tuning in. We look forward to your feedback.